All right. Well, hello, everyone. I'm glad to see everybody here tonight. Uh, welcome to the Esai Clinic for November. I'm Alex Brickoff, and I'll be your host tonight. Our clinic is sponsored by uh, the Fourth Division of the PNR of the NMRA. Without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Larry Sloan. Uh, Larry, would you uh, take it away? Hey, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Larry Sloan. I've been a member of the uh, NMRA Fourth Division for a long time now, and not, not nearly as long as some of you guys. Um, and I'm the chair for the Fourth Division HO Fremo Group, um, which led to me making a looking to build a building that is a replica of something that's in Puyallup. And so that's what this, this clinic is about. I found out that the building that I was looking to model was called a bowstring truss building. It's kind of an interesting one. You guys may have seen them around the Northwest and at, uh, you know, places like the Simpson lumber mill and, uh, you know, a long Boeing field as part of the, you know, structures down there that were used for aircraft hangars and things like that. The scope of this presentation is partially about modeling the specific building, but largely about modeling a general roof style and what I've learned in trying to do that. So this building was a construction wholesale supplier uh, down in Puyallup, and it was called DW Briggs. And uh, it's now a different business, but at some time in the past, it, the plant received shipments by rail. I first looked for some kits that can resemble the building uh, not finding any, then I decided to see how close I could get to modeling the structure. Uh, I called this building a rounded roof, but was informed by other modelers, namely Russ Segner, that it's called a bowstring truss. Let's see, you can see several angles on the building there that I got from driving around and, and using the uh, the zoom uh, lens on my phone or on my, my camera to get closer pictures of it. This um, is an interior shot of an example. This building happens to be a newer style, so it has a more, uh, a better roof style of it. And it happens to belong apparently to Alaska Airlines or did belong to Alaska Airlines at one point. These, this type of building was used in industrial structures uh, since the 30s and into the 60s, but not, you know, not really much anymore. The name is uh, derived as in a, the both the truss type is is derived from the name you know bow and arrow kind of thing, and originally made of wood. They were prone to failure, especially in fires, which is a reason why a big reason why you don't see them in use today. So this is an example of a building that's actually in Kent. It's a cold storage building, much like the big part of the one that that actually burned recently in Puyallup. Some of you may have heard about that. Um, and uh, this is Washington cold storage. So this one's just rolled roofing. This one uh, is another picture I copied from a random website. This was the old Simpson timber mill or uh, mill in um, Shelton, Washington. And they had a lot of bowstring truss buildings. If you look back there in the background, you'll see that there's uh, a lot of round roof buildings back there. They sold the plant uh, to, and they closed it. And the company that bought it, which I think was Sierra Pacific, came through and, and took down a lot of those buildings and have built some new buildings in their places. So you won't see those anymore. This is uh, where I started uh, on modeling the structure. I decided that since the structure would live on a module, it needed rigidity. I also didn't want to spend a ton of money on material that's not seen. So I made the structure uh, from foam core board. For about three bucks, you can get a 20 by 30 sheet of this stuff. And I needed something round to go off of. And the only thing I had handy was a bucket of spackle. So I took the bucket of spackle and drew the circle around the uh, for the top. And uh, later someone suggested that I should have used a dinner plate for a more broad curve. And I agree with that. This is this curve is is way too much. But without much more than the info I got, uh, info the measurements that I got from basically looking at Google Earth, um, I took this stuff and, and started to build the structure. This is my first attempt uh, at building the structure. Uh, here I'm using uh, some 
shelf angles that uh, you know you can find at your average hardware store and some clothes pins as my clamps to hold the uh, the foam core together while the glue dries i use elmer's wood wood glue for this i've used uh, some other things like uh, eileen's tacky glue and i find that the elmer's actually works uh, better for this uh, than anything else that i've tried uh, this was my first go at this type of building, and I'm going to build some others someday. But I got the main the main structure uh, parts with a sharp utility knife, not an exacto. Uh, I find the exacto blades are are too floppy for cutting this material, and you don't get a nice straight edge. You get an edge that waves. So the the angle brackets really make a good clamp for this kind of thing, and it doesn't take very long at all. For, for that to dry. You can also use the little tiny plastic clamps that you can buy at Harbor Freight. You can buy them by the dozen for like four bucks or something. They used Eileen's tacky glue to affix a plain sheet of evergreen styrene uh, 0.005 to the ribs. As you can see, I also used painter's tape to hold it in place while the glue dried. Uh, while a thin sheet follows the curve, <clears throat> the styrene is also too thin to really provide solid support. I ended up adding these uh, braces to help with warping. In the future, I will do this first. As you can imagine, it was a royal pain to do it afterwards. The shingles didn't want to adhere to the curve and the tape would stick, to, stick and tear the shingles. So I used pieces of styrene taped over to hold the, the shingles in place while the glue dried. This looked really good until I painted it. After I painted it, because <clears throat> um, the shingles came in the wrong color for the building I was modeling, they started to warp, which didn't look good at all. This would be helped if I had less of a curve uh, and uh, also had some more braces uh, in the roof. You can see where how badly the shingles actually pulled that styrene up and made it uh, made it warp. If I had more lengthwise braces to it uh, as well as you know uh, ones that go across from side to side i think that'll work much better the color dried uh, way lighter and redder than i wanted so i went over it with burnt umber and i actually think the color turned out pretty good eventually i call this slide problem solved by other problems uh, the roof structure needed to overhang but and the end in just a little bit. As it turns out, the shingles created the overhang that I needed, but the middle was missing that. The shingles also left a ridge at the top. So I layered over another sheet of 0.005 styrene, and then I cut it so it overhangs to match the shingles. After I glued down the extra layer of styrene, I took some tissue paper and cut it into strips. I started with glue and finished it with a pale gray acrylic with a little burnt umber mixed in. That actually concludes the first part of my presentation. Uh, does anybody have any questions? I do, Larry. Okay, Bob, go ahead. Did your prototype utilize shingles? They don't shed water when you reach the peak. Uh, that's why most of the buildings in the photos had uh, a rolled roofing or hot tar roofing. Yeah, that building was really odd. Um, and this, I should say it is really odd. I zoomed in with my camera and I was able to tell that the lower parts of the sides of the roof were shingles and the upper middle piece was rolled roofing. I don't know, you guys have probably experienced this if you've ever went to actually model a specific building, but you soon find that they did some, they probably did some pretty odd things in that, right? And of course, as soon as you go to, to build that building, first you start out thinking, well, this is not too bad, but then you go to model the building and you find they did some really weird things that you end up having to try to, if you're gonna try to replicate the building, <laughs> you end up struggling to replicate all of that. And you'll see more of that uh, in a few minutes. Anybody else? There's quite a few buildings in the Burbank. Uh, the movie studios use that uh, structure, that type of structure in the 20s and 30s. And I guess if anybody's down in the LA area, they might want to stop by there and uh, or do, do a little uh, electronic surveillance. 
uh, with Google, uh, but that's quite a common uh, type of structure uh, in that area. Yeah, it sure large, was. Large open, large open span. Yep. And there still are a lot of them around, but they tend not to build them these days because those roofs were prone. If they had a, especially if they had a fire, they were prone to collapse. And so fire departments really, you know, didn't like them. So um, that's, and also they would put the, the bow would go, you know, over the top and it would sit on the top of the sides of the building. So if there was a, if the place happened to be earthquake prone and the sides of the buildings would shift, then you could have the whole, the whole truss collapse inside the building too. They've stopped building buildings like that. I, it kind of actually makes me wonder how the ones in California have survived for all these years, you know? Yep, Larry, some of that something was shown in your Alaska Airlines photo. Yeah. Um, there you can see off to the left of the photo, there is a tie that ties the truss to the wall. You see it right there at the very edge of the photo, left edge. See that red triangular piece oh, with, yeah. right there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see it that. Ties the truss to the walls. So this is a very modern truss where they have addressed earthquake lateral force um, requirements. It's it was interesting because this was really I had a hard time finding interior shots or pictures of a bow truss building. This was basically the best example I could find. I love doing presentations because a lot of times I'll pick up stuff from people while I'm actually presenting, fill in details that I didn't know. So anyway, um, Larry. Yeah, Russ. Uh, I had a number of clients in the industrial area, the Soto Center, who had bowstring truss roofs on, on structures. And the best one is on 6th Avenue at uh, Lander Street, uh, which was uh, a, a moving and storage building. Then FedEx took it over. And then it's uh, been uh, subsequently purchased for uh, a series of smaller uh, tenants. Typically, these did have the rolled roofing on them, and they could be a pretty good uh, radius, uh, not as flat as this, to shed snow. Snow loads would be the biggest problem. The one thing that I always thought was interesting is that the material that extends between the trusses which normally you would expect to have purlins and so on, was actually two by sixes on edge, laminated across the entire surface of the roof. So it was a very heavy structure insofar as all of the lumber that was involved in it. I've got some pretty good photos in my industrial file if I could find it. And I've been hunting here, furiously not finding it. A lot of, the, they were quite common. There's another good one at, um, in Ballard along the ship canal, just east of the uh, Ballard Bridge that has some very interesting uh, structure elements to it. Not only the, the barrel roof or the uh, bowstring truss roof, but it has plywood sheathing on the sides. It was built in the forties and a uh, very interesting uh, structure. I mean, there was really a lot of those buildings in this area uh, at one point. I remember seeing them when I was uh, coming up uh, I-5 North when I was a uh, when I was a kid, uh, whenever we would go to Seattle, and it was just amazing to me seeing those all those round buildings because, if, you know, there and and only there and like in places like Shelton and and some place a couple places in Aberdeen did you see those, and it wasn't until I started trying to do this and did some research that I found that I found out why you don't see them uh, anymore. It, very interesting things about model railroad. You guys know you you become a student of history and engineering. Any other questions or comments? Some of the round barns, they weren't rounded completely, but they were certainly bowed. Right. They came to a peak. Some of those were built more than a hundred years ago. I hadn't realized they were laminated lumber, cur uh, lumber forced around pegs on the deck, glued, uh, laminated and then stood up to give you that, uh, what is a real common Dutch roof? Is that what it is? But they've stood for a hundred years, a different kind of um, structure, Yeah, not a truss. It's pretty neat what they used to do with some of the old uh, 
wooden structures, you know, before we had all the, the steel and everything that goes along with that. Anyway. If, uh, can you let me share my screen briefly? Just real quick, uh, I finally found one of these. Uh, this is Lander Street here, and this is Sixth Avenue. And this is the two structures side by side, bowstring truss roof, roof systems. What was always interesting to me was how they handled the water and snow here in this place where it was joined. They had yeah. to pitch the water both directions. But the interesting thing is that the each end, the roof structure is flat. And so it had a different um, roof system uh, to support the flat roof. But it's also part of a larger complex brick building adjoining it, and then a concrete uh, structure, uh, which was cast in place concrete with a roof, all the salt concrete with parking on top of it. Very interesting complex. And then there's another one adjoining to the south, another two. It's all owned by the same family. And I'm happy to say that was one of my largest transactions just before I retired. Yeah, pretty interesting. Hey, Larry, I was going to, this is Lee. I was going to offer a couple of more comments because um, you, you guys were talking about kind of the why did they use that type of roof and that you know in the early 20th century that was the only thing out here that was economically feasible for long span um, roofs you know where you needed a big open area and like your Alaska uh, hangar shows that really well you can't have columns you know at 20 feet on center or 25 feet on center there yep. <clears throat> and so the alternate would have been steel but that would have been incredibly expensive because it would have had to have been fabricated and shipped from the east at that time. And right. so we had tons of wood out here. You just bolt it together. Right. So it was uh, kind of a logical thing to do for the industry here locally. And today we have, you know, uh, bar trusses or um, bar joists that you can buy steel truss. And many of those are fabricated in the Salt Lake area, for example. So um, they're easy to transport. And, you know, the big box stores are using that today. But in the early 20th century, wood was the thing. The interesting thing is some of these buildings I've seen on cinder block or concrete block walls. But this particular set of buildings that I mentioned here at 6th and Lander were in, on cast concrete walls with pilasters and so on cast in place. And um, if you're in the area, I commend it to you to go down and take a look. They did an exposed aggregate finish on the outside walls uh, just for architectural features and so on. I was trying to model that at one point too and I ended up painting sandpaper. Okay, part two. So, this was the building that I was looking at. And uh, as you can see, I mean, it looks like almost a shiplap exterior, but it's painted or not painted, but it actually looks like it's a metal exterior. It's really, it's really odd. Those two doors are so close. You couldn't put two 40 foot box cars together and use both doors. So, uh, but that's the way I was going to build the model because, you know, it looks like the prototype. So here's the, Here's the cutouts for the doors. When I went to do that, I didn't have any doors that were even close to the prototype. So I built some frames out of evergreen styrene uh, 060 angle. For the cement foundation, I put down some tissue paper with gray paint. And then after that dried, I used a sponge and a wash of India ink with alcohol to give it some character. <clears throat> well, you'll notice the seams in the building. And I replicated this by making cuts every few feet on the surface. And then I applied an India ink wash to make the doors seem well loved. The gutter is, is uh, a 100 uh, styrene channel. And then of course I painted the sides with, uh, and I feel like I'm just gonna say this later in this presentation, but I painted the sides with a silver Sharpie because I found that was the easiest thing to paint the styrene with. This is the other side of the building. And I had to guess at the window sizes and locations. One of the more modern windows, uh, <clears throat> the left, like of the more modern windows, the left window appears to be slightly smaller than its partner. I guessed 
they were four by six. That style of window has not been made in HO. From, <clears throat> from the searching I've done, none of those windows come up. So I cut window holes for this side. The right windows are the modern style, not made by any manufacturers. And I started to make scratch built windows. Oh, one thing to note, you'll notice that this looks backwards from the prototype. And there's a reason for that. I laid out the track without, you know, looking at some, you know, satellite photos and such. And then when I actually went and compared my track layout to the real thing, I realized that I'd laid out the track backwards. So I ended up having to build the buildings backwards to make that work. So this building is actually reversed from the real thing, believe it or not. It was kind of annoying to do it that way, but there you go. I cut open the door for the, or cut open the wall for the door. Here's where you start to see me painting the side of it with the Sharpie. I tried, I've tried painting with a silver acrylic flow quill, and I find that it really is not, it really doesn't work well at all. That stuff just is not, is not a good paint. It's almost like a stain. And since then, I've discovered a Tamiya rattle pan actually does a really nice job. It's a AS11, uh, does a really nice job for silver. And if I'd known that, it would have saved me a lot of time when I was doing this. Here I'm test fitting my window frames and the door frame that I made. The quote unquote lights in the window here is actually 1 64th chart tape attached to the clear styrene. Uh, the frames are evergreen styrene angle. Close up, my window frames look pretty sloppy, but three feet away. Now, these are three of the windows in place. And together and from a distance, I actually think they turned out pretty good. Here I'm working on the man door uh, for that side of the building. Uh, from the best picture I have, it appears as an outside glass door and an inner solid door. I couldn't find an HO door that looked like it. So I built one out of evergreen styrene angles and strip material. The windows on the upper right are modified Titchy products. Those on the lower right are custom from Styrene L, uh, L strips. Those were 060. Since then, my friend Chip Van Gilder actually 3D printed some more modern aluminum frames for the windows. And those actually worked pretty good, but I already had these made. I painted the black frame of the window uh, on the upper right with a Sharpie. It looks crude in the picture, but from the usual viewing distance, it works well. On the lower left, the inner door is shown by painting the foam core brown. The right windows uh, are the Titchy products that I mentioned before. And that's as far as I really got with this building. There's a lot of stuff on the outside of the building, uh, electrical wires and all kinds of things like that that are, that are interesting details that I definitely want to add to it at some point. Any comments or questions? Getting back to your building, I'm looking at it here. Can't help but wonder if the two freight doors, if they were maybe modified at some point from a uh, truck height door to a rail car door, or what is that along the bottom? Oh, all that stuff along the bottom is actually cement, it looks like. That's just the, oh. if you're talking about the stuff along there, it's... No, uh, I, I'm looking at the uh, at the two cargo doors right at the ground level, just about, you know, like a... Yeah, they might have been... Yeah, originally yeah those, those. So that is actually, that is, from near as I can tell, because I haven't been into the building or anything, but near as I can tell, that looks like it's actually concrete that somebody painted white right at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And this picture was taken zoomed in from the side of Pioneer Avenue. As you know, that's the BNSF main line there. So mm -hmm. I was stretching up to try to get high enough to get over the, uh, the railroad. You don't really think, I think you don't really think about how high the, the actual main line is there, but it's actually quite high. If you look at the satellite view, this, in this picture, you can actually see the roof of both buildings, but you can also tell that the track comes down alongside the, uh, the longer building and stops. But if you look at this from different angles, you can tell that at some point the track went clear down 
uh, past that round roof building. Part of the reason it looks so low in the other picture that I was showing is because where the building is built is at least two feet lower than the BNSF main line. So you, mm -hmm. when you're looking at it, you're, you know, from a, from over here on the road, you're not, you know, it looks like it's really low, but it's not actually that low. So over here is Gerard Wood Products. And of course there's, you know, five or uh, yeah, 512. And then um, uh, DW Briggs or what was DW Briggs. It's not that anymore. And the round roof building. And like I said, this track that's right next to the building used to extend down towards where the cold storage was. And this is the building that burned a couple months ago. I appreciate him bringing this uh, type of prototype to our attention. It's a neat structure, lots of possibilities. Pretty common for the 40s, 30s and 40s. Definitely, definitely. You used to see a lot of uh, bolt truss structures around. Not so much anymore, but they used to be a lot more common. I mentioned the building in Ballard. There it is. And cool. there's your bowstring. It's got a tier of windows all the way around the top to let light in. And then I thought you, Larry was talking about doors. These are very interesting rail doors. You build whatever you want, and then it rolls into, a, it's hidden on a track that's underneath this, this shroud right here. Uh, a lot of detail here, your downspouts. There's different doors down here. This track is still in the pavement and it went over, there was been a turnout in here and down to the end and then the track would have come back. They often did that with these old structures where it's pretty tight. But in this area, um, Interbay, there's a, a, a whole cluster of them. There's a couple more over here. If you're interested at some point, since this was my business, I'd be happy to take you on an aerial tour of this whole trackage along the ship canal, actually both sides of it. A lot of interesting structures, most many of which were rail served. A lot of fodder for, uh, for small models. Well, yeah. the surprising thing is a lot of them were relatively small. Yeah. The larger spans didn't come into play until after the Second World War. And then with the advent of concrete tilt-up structures in the 50s. You know, point, to, to Russ's comment about the spans, those bowstring trusses would allow a span large enough for these industrial applications to operate a bridge crane beneath. So... Yes. Um, you know, many of the of the plants down there, the businesses might have had need for bridge cranes. And so um, very common um, need to have something that could span far enough to accommodate that. Well, the interesting thing is you'd find a bowstring truss down the center, 60 feet in span. And then on each side of that would be a flat roof or a, a slopey roof structure uh, on either side of the crane bay where all the machinery was. That's right. And very typical. Uh, there's a ton of those types of buildings they are disappearing fast now in Soto, but at, at Horton Street, uh, south of the Starbucks complex off First Avenue South are two really neat buildings that have both cranes in the, uh, the middle bay. And many of them had dirt floors. <laughs> all, all of the machine shops did. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then I was intrigued with the uh, one of the steel fabricators, uh, it had a wooden floor, uh, but where they were working on steel fabrication, they had put down sheet steel. It was like an inch thick, big plates about uh, oh, 10 by 20. I mean, they're huge. Wow. And when they wanted to fabricate something, they had the saw horses, which were also steel. They would just tack weld them to the floor <laughs> and then do their fabricating and then they were done, they would just cut it away and, and grind the floor down and start another project. Hey, to Larry, I was um, wondering to all of you, I don't know if you're aware of this, but I uh, recently on a little project where I was gluing a lot of foam core together at Office Depot, I found this scotch, um, what's it called? Uh, clear glue with um, just a, um, with an applicator. It's got a little unscrew it little applicator at the top man it works great for just running a bead along uh, edge of foam core 
and, mm. and it dries clear. It's super strong, really kind of a cool thing. Hey, Lee, do you think that works uh, better than Elmer's even or uh, anything like that? I, I have a feeling that it's stronger than Elmer's. Um, mm. I mean, Elmer's works really great on porous stuff and, and foam core, you know, the foam and the paper are both porous. Um, but what I found was so cool was this stuff's really easy to apply. You can just run a real nice bead. Um, so the size of the applicator is more in proportion to the foam core edge than mm. is um, a typical, um, you know, Elmer's glue bottle. Anybody else have any questions for Larry? Yeah, I was going to comment that uh, some of the truss bridges have a doubler, I would say, structure of this uh, bow type thing, and uh, that's kind of would be interesting. It would, it's not a, it's not a building, but uh, it's, it's something to show uh, on the outside uh, for all to see how the uh, the bow type structure can reinforce the uh, the Warren truss or how truss uh, railroad bridges. Russ, I think it was on the narrow gauge video website, but Robin Peel did an absolutely marvelous presentation on the difference in scale and gauge. It It is worth watching for all of you. It is cool. Hey, Lee, that was actually a clinic that he did for us uh, here at East. Okay, uh, cool. Okay, I missed yeah. the clinic live and, and watched it later. I was just scrolling through looking for it. Um, yeah. so. Yeah, that was that was an outstanding clinic that he did. It was really good. Man, that's stuff I had been trying to figure out for years. And he put it all together really nicely. Yeah, he did. He did. He did a fantastic job. I'm going to share a screen again. You see all this stuff? Those are all airbrushes. Hmm. And uh, they're available at bargain prices. I'm going to post a pretty good inventory of the pieces like this uh, that have not been sold. The fourth division uh, generated uh, well over $2,000 worth of sales from mm -hmm. items donated to 4D from a variety of sources. And there's still a lot left. So we'll figure a way to make it available to anybody that's willing to drive over here and pick it up. Our next clinic is going to be on December 16th. And uh, so to close out the calendar year and to shoot all of us head first into the new year, I decided to uh, try something a little bit different. Rather than having a regular clinic, I'm going to have a uh, uh, historical photo essay uh, set to music and it's is going to be uh, a series of black and white photos about the final days of the Milwaukee Road uh, on the Coast Division. Uh, some of you may know uh, the photographer, and I'm going to slaughter his name, I'm sure. It's uh, a project that was put together by Blair Koistra, or Kustra, however he pronounces it, and uh, kind of stumbled across it by accident on uh, Vimeo one time here a couple months ago. And I watched it a couple of times and I thought, man, this is really a uh, very well done uh, piece of work. Being uh, a photographer uh, uh, by interest in another world, uh, I'm kind of tuned into railroad photography as well. So I kind of really fell in love with, it, with his work. So I thought that I would share that with you guys uh, next month. And that's going to take place uh, of our regular clinic. Uh, the uh, presentation is called Remembering the Milwaukee Rose Coast Division. It's about 28 minutes long. Uh, Blair's going to do some narration, not in person, but on the, uh, on the uh, video. And it's going to be set to music. And I, I, I'm hoping you'll like it. It's something a little bit, something a little bit different, uh, you know, just something for, for the holidays. So that's what we're going to do next time. We bring popcorn, cookies, and, and wine to our screens? Uh, yeah, you guys can if you want. I mean, it's up to you. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have uh, 
Oh, I'll have some of my favorite beverage here. <laughs> Good idea. I've I've yeah. seen this uh, that Alex speaks of. It's excellent, and yes. I'm an old Milwaukee guy, and it you know sort of gets you a little teary a little bit. Yeah, it's yeah, it very does, well definitely. done. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, stay tuned uh, for next month. That's what we're going to do, and uh, anyway, so in regards to. Uh, Future uh, future clinics and activities that the East Side might uh, might be doing in the new year. Uh, the best your best resource for information on that is the online grab iron. Uh, a lot of people are asking me if I keep a mailing list of uh, of activities and uh, that sort of thing, and uh, I don't. I don't. I simply rely on uh, putting posts in the grab iron. Whatever information you want to find out about the East Side Clinic, just head out to the uh, Grab Iron and it'll be there. And of course, you can always send, send me an email or give me a call. That's always available to you, too. Is the uh, Tacoma show on over Christmas? The Tacoma Museum, Washington State Historical Museum as in Tacoma? I, yes. As far as I know, as far as I know, it is, Bob. It is. Well, we have three modular groups there. Larry's group will be there the 40 n track group will be there and the ho um, modular group will be there so go down and, and run trains i mean the guys will be looking for uh, for help running trains the boeing club will be there also hmm. well uh if there are no more comments or announcements i'm gonna bring our clinic to a close tonight so i want to wish everybody a very happy thanksgiving Hope everybody has uh, plenty of turkey and gravy and mashed potatoes and whatever else you guys like to eat for Thanksgiving. Cranberries. So until next, and cranberries. Got to have cranberries. <laughs> so anyway, until next time, I hope that everybody stays safe, stays healthy, has a great holiday, and we'll see you all next month. Take care, guys.